Using noise is a really great way to introduce an organic or random element into your code. In this video, I'm going to explain a bit about what noise is and show you how you can use noise inside a shader by creating a simple example of using it to blend two textures together. If you're not familiar with shaders, you can check out my introduction video, which will bring you up to speed with everything you need to know to get started. To put it simply though, we'll be using shaders to run some code to calculate the color of every single pixel on the screen very quickly. And as always, you can find a link to the code in the description so you can edit and run the code in your browser and follow along with this video. Video. To get started, what is noise? Noise is just random values that a computer can use for all sorts of things like graphical effects and procedural generation. Values from noise are usually in the range of 0 to 1, which makes it very easy to visualize with values of 0 being black and 1 being white with shades of gray for everything in between. The most basic noise is called white noise and when visualized it looks like TV static. Typically noise has a spatial dimension to it. For instance, a 2D area which lets us use an X and a Y coordinate to specify a point and get a noise value back for that point. Point. And this can be for any number of dimensions. In white noise, neighboring values have no relation to each other, so you can get a big variation in values. But there are other types of noise, such as Perlin noise, where neighboring values are related to each other, so the noise appears nice and smooth. There are a whole bunch of noise generation algorithms, and each one has different characteristics and can be used to achieve completely different effects. And while you can generate noise on the fly in a shader, it can be a bit slow to make the GPU do that. So most of the time, people will generate the noise beforehand and store it in a texture which can then be passed into the shader. This way, all the shader needs to do is look up a texture, which the GPU can do very quickly. And this is what we'll be doing today. If you want to generate noise in the shader or are just interested in how noise is generated, I've left a few links in the description where you can learn some more. So now we've explored a bit of the theory, let's dive into using a noise texture in a shader. For this video, I'm using P5.js, which is a creative coding library that makes it really easy to get shaders up and running. P5.js uses GLSL for its shader code. So the code we write here should be usable anywhere that GLSL is used, but your setup steps will likely be a bit different. On that note, to get set up, we need to do a few things. Firstly, we need to put P5 into WebGL mode by adding the keyword in the create canvas function. P5 has to be in WebGL mode for shaders to work. We also need to specify the preload function, which lets us load in all the files that we'll need. In here, we'll load in our shader files using the load shader function. I've created a blend.vert and a blend.frag for the vertex and the fragment shaders respectively. We'll also need to load in the two textures that we want to blend. I've got a grass and a a dirt texture, which I got from Open Game Art, which you can find linked in the description. We can load these in using the load image function, specifying the file names. Lastly, we'll need a noise texture. If you Google noise texture, you'll get a whole bunch of options, and I'd encourage you to try out a bunch of them and see how they change the output. For this video though, I'll be using the image from the Wikipedia article on Perlin noise, which I've also linked in the description. Just like before, we can load this image in using the load image function. In the setup function, we can pass our newly loaded shader into the shader function, which will tell P5 to use our shader when drawing stuff on the screen. We can also pass all of our loaded textures into the shader files by using the set uniform function. We have to specify a name for the uniforms and these will have to exactly match the uniforms that we'll set up in the shader file. The last bit of setup we need to do is to draw a rectangle on the screen. This pushes some geometry to the GPU and will trigger our shader to run. The actual dimensions of this rectangle don't matter because we'll make it take up the entire screen in the vertex shader. To that end, let's go to the vertex shader now. This is a standard vertex shader I use when making full screen effects and if you've seen my other shader videos, you'll probably be familiar with it. To go over it briefly though, I'm setting the varying vec2 called pos to be the texture coordinate. And I'm not sure if this is a P5 thing or not, but we have to invert the Y value for our images to be up the right way. And then, like I mentioned before, I'm going to make the vertices of our rectangle take up the full screen by scaling them to be in the range of negative one to one. And that's all we need for the vertex shader. Moving on to the fragment shader, this is where all the interesting stuff happens for this effect. The first thing we want to do is make all the uniforms that we set up earlier so we can get all the texture data that we're setting from the CPU. And remember, these uniform names have to match what we put in the JavaScript. I've also got a varying vec2 called pos, which matches the one we had in the vertex shader. And this is how we know which pixel we're working on inside the fragment shader. We can check everything set up correctly by reading our first texture at the current pixel, storing it in a variable called color one and outputting that on the screen by setting the GL frag color. When we do this, we should get our dirt texture on the screen, which we do and we can repeat this for the second texture and the noise texture. So we're reading the textures in the shader and we're able to output them on the screen, but we can only show a single image at a time. So now we need to start blending them together. Thankfully, GLSL has a mix function that makes this really easy for us. Let's make the output color equal to the mix function and we'll pass in the two colors for the values that we're mixing between. And for the moment, we can use our X position to control the mix. When our X position is zero or on the left, we'll get the first color as our output. And when our X position is one or on the right, we'll 
we'll get the second color. And if the X position is in between, we get a linear gradient from left to right that blends between the two images. Let's see what happens if we use our noise value instead. At the moment, we're reading the noise texture and getting a VEC4 in response, but we only want a single float for our noise value. Since our noise texture is grayscale, the red, green, and blue channel are all the same, so we can use any of them, and I'll use the red channel here. This is something that's really good to keep in mind. You can use the different color channels, including the alpha, for different types of noise, so each texture is basically four noise textures. Now that we've got a single float for our noise, we can pass that directly into our mix function and see what we get. The result is a splotchy looking image that has regions of the grass texture and regions of the dirt. And this is exactly what we wanted. The textures are being blended together using a noise texture inside a shader. With how we've got this set up, we haven't got a lot of control on how we're using the noise and the output is a bit of a mess between the two textures. To fix this, let's add two constant floats called threshold and range. And for the moment, we'll set them both to 0.5. With the threshold and range variables, we'll be able to control the split between grass and dirt and also how quickly they blend into each other. To do this, we can use the smooth step function. We'll define a new float called T and we'll set it to the output output of the smooth step function, which takes in three values. The first two define the edges and the third is the value being tested. If the tested value is less than the first edge, we get zero. And if the value is above the second edge, we get a one. If the value is in between the two edges, then we get a value that smoothly transitions between zero and one. We want to use our noise value as the value being tested. And then for the low edge, we'll use our threshold minus the range. And for the high edge, we'll use the threshold plus the range. We can then use the T value we've just calculated to control the mix function in the output. It doesn't look like a lot's changed here, but let's see how different threshold and range values change the effect. If we keep the threshold at 0.5 and set the range to zero, you can see there's an immediate transition from dirt to grass. Now, if we increase the range up to 0.2, the blending returns and we get a smooth transition again from dirt to grass. So the range value changes how quickly the transition occurs. Now let's play around with the threshold. I've set it to 0.25 and as you can see, it gives us a lot of grass in the output. And if we nudge it the other way up to 0.75, we now have more dirt. So the threshold changes the ratio of the first texture to the second in the output. We can also very simply change the scale of the noise we're using. To do this, let's divide the position by two when we're sampling the noise texture. This effectively makes the noise twice as large, which is reflected in the output. We can also go the other way by multiplying the position by two, which makes the noise half as big. But you can see we get some weird stuff going on. And this is because our position value is now out of the zero to one range. And there are two ways to fix this. Either you can set up your shader environment to repeat textures so that if you sample a pixel out of the range, it'll wrap it around so it's in range. Or if you want to do it inside the shader, you can use the fract function on the position, which will also wrap the value so it's always in the zero to one range, which is what I'm going to do. Now you can see that our noise is more zoomed out, but we also get seams where the noise texture repeats. And this is something you'll have to keep in mind if you want to use noise over a large area. You can get seamless noise textures though, which will completely fix this problem. So there we are. Hopefully you've got a bit of a better understanding about what a noise texture is and how you can use one inside a shader. There are so many different ways that noise textures can be used and I'd really encourage you to play around with them and see what cool things you can come up with. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. If you found this video helpful at all and want to see more like it, it would be great if you could give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing as well. You might enjoy this video next and I've got a playlist with all my shader videos if you want more of that. Thank you so much for watching, happy coding and I hope to see you again soon.